today to welcome Eileen John, who will talk about philosophical ideas at work in literature. Eileen John York Center for Research in Philosophy, Literature, and writes regularly about the philosophical ideas at work in literature, being inspired especially as Grace Paley, uh, Jenny Effenbeck, J.M. Cotizi, and Charles Johnson. Uh, and now, I, Eileen, let's begin with this question. Experience are appropriate in responding to fictional characters, but not in response to real people. Thanks, Michael. I'll, I'm going to say three things about this. Um, where I think fictional characters are important to giving us certain kinds of freedom of response that often are not appropriate in re relation to the real people we deal with. So I'll just name them first and then say a little bit about each. Um, one is generalizing. Fictional characters enable us to generalize ambitiously, to come up with categories um, that are interesting to us. So anyway, generalizing, aestheticizing, and what I call judgmental freedom. So I'll come back, I'll just say a, a word about each of them. Um, with real people, you will of course put them into general categories, but I think you should always be aware that those general categories will be inadequate to who that person is. They're going to be distinctive. They're going to resist categorization that's adequate in certain ways. And you always have to grant them that elusiveness from your generalizing moves. I think with fictional characters, that's exactly one of the things you should be doing with them, thinking, what kind of being are you? <laughs> what what you know networks of properties do you put together and what can i make of that you know what sort of a combination of um general possibilities are showing up in this character and i think that's that's like their design for that that goes back to aristotle's thinking about the fictional mode um and we need as thinkers to generalize like we need to be picking up on patterns we need to be categorizing things do that with fictional characters do it much more cautiously and tentatively with real people okay so i'll leave that aestheticizing i won't say so much about but of course we do uh oh a phone is ringing here i'm going to ignore it um we we do luxuriate in the experience of real people. We think they're beautiful or hideous or just, you know, kind of quirky to experience. Of course we do that, but we always need to be aware that that um, aestheticization of them is, should be lower priority than listening to them, understanding them, respecting them, taking them seriously as agents. Whereas <laughs> with a fictional character, that can be the greatness of them, that they're so interesting to think about, to like pay attention to exactly how they say things or the rudeness of the way they react to situations. Um, the, just the sort of odd kind of characteristics they can display, you can luxuriate in them. And that's totally appropriate. And it meets a certain need we have to pick up on the aesthetic qualities of our experience, including the experience of humans or people. Okay. But lastly, um, something that that sort of leads into is the idea that we are built to evaluate, to judge, to size things up on all kinds of criteria, ethical, aesthetic, but everything else, annoying, um, um, uh, sort of pleasurable in all sorts of ways. And that is something the fictional mode encourages us to do, to just go after what it is you don't like or do like about a human figure, a, a person, an agent, um, 
and I think that's that's meets a need we have. You know, we we're we're going to size things up. But again, stepping back, this is um, this is often something we should uh, restrict ourselves on or or realize the intrusiveness of the judgments we make about real people and their their um, inadequate bases. Like we don't know enough about real people um, to be confidently dismissive of them or, you know, um, cast them as villains or um, th that's just something we ought to sort of approach. Well, we just should restrict our freedom, our judgmental freedom in relation to real people. I think with fictional characters, that again is just one of the things they are open to and we should exploit that with them. There are ways we can go astray with this judgmental freedom, but um, I'm not saying that you can't do it badly in relation to a fictional character, but there's a certain openness to it that I think is um, one of the values of fiction for us. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Follow-up uh, question here is, what can we learn about philosophical thought and argument of these? Yeah, I guess I've been interested in works of fiction that do portray philosophical thought and argument. Um, and of course, this goes back to Plato. Those are works of fiction portraying philosophical thought and argument. And I'm always interested in Plato in that way. Like, not just what are the ideas, but how is he staging the argument? And what are some of the things we can think about um, that people do very fruitfully with Plato, for instance? Um, what are people's, so it's the context of argument that gets to show up in the fictional mode and it's the people carrying out the arguments. And so you get to think about how they are engaging with each other, what each interlocutor brings to the table in the argument. So it's often not the solitary thinker or debater, but it's the person trying to get an idea across to an interlocutor or audience of some kind. If that's what's going on, then you can think about the motives behind argumentation. Um, you can think about mis- firing of argument, like when the, the people participating are not communicating well, and then you can think about why they're not communicating well. So sometimes you can, you can see the ambiguity in the issue. You can see that, oh, well, so-and-so is assuming this, and so the other is assuming that something different, and they're not you know, on the same page in some important philosophical sense. Um, I think that the other thing is sometimes authors are interested in, I guess what you'd call what it's like to think philosophically. And that can be quite illuminating. So let me let me just give you a few examples that will illustrate each of these points, like what you get from seeing the context, the human context of argument, and then a little bit about thinking. Um, so, um, there's a Flannery O'Connor story that I've written about that's called The Barber. And there's all sorts of things that go on in that story that are interesting about argument and failed argument. But there's a philosopher character in the story. So he teaches philosophy at college level. And he says, I won't explain exactly why he says that, but he says, I never argue. And so this is a bit of a puzzle for the reader who will think, you're a philosopher, you're going to argue. <laughs> but I think what he's saying is that he doesn't really argue. He will assess arguments, he will lay them out clearly, but he's not going to get in the business of really defending a conclusion. And so it's quite an interesting story for, if you're a philosopher reading this thinking, how often do I really argue? How often am I standing behind what I conclude? Um, so, okay, one little thing, like what happens when you encounter philosophical arguers, let's say in fiction, 
you can you can ask some questions that you might not ordinarily ask i think that are important um different um example you may know um in virginia wolf's novel to the lighthouse one of the characters mr ramsey is a philosopher and wolf gives what I think of as both a hilarious and kind of mocking, but then also sort of sympathetic account of his problem as a thinker that he's gotten, I actually can't remember, he's gotten to like the, from A to P, sort of an alphabetic progression in his thinking, and he just can't get to Q. It might not be P and Q, I can't remember, <laughs> but he just can't make that next step. And I, I find it as just a nice evocation of the difficulty where you seem to have known how to get to the point you're at, and then you just can't quite figure out what next, where do I go from here, that maybe there does need to be some creative leap, even though you think you've just been thinking logically the whole time, <laughs> maybe that's not enough, logic won't get you to the next step. So I kind of like that mixed image of philosophical thinking in Wolf. And I'll give you one last example, a poet I've been thinking about recently, Emily Dickinson, who I think is very philosophically engaged. But the way she portrays the relations between ideas uh, is very um, networked. And she's interested in how all these different ways we try to under understand reality do not reduce to the same thing. And yet she's not willing to say that some of them are nonsense or pointless. So there's sort of the human sensory mode. There's the divine grand plan mode. There's the um, the 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 fact of death and how we um, try to conceive of our fin finitude. These, these are all things um, she's working with, perhaps in one tiny poem. And, and so for me, it's a, again, like a provocation, like how much can you pack in, in your thinking? How well can you um, grasp the connectedness of all your different philosophical modes. So, and I think a poem can actually portray that partly because of the way it links words and gets you to associate things or gets you to pause and switch modes amid, you know, mid stanza or something like that. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, next uh, question is, how can a work of fiction philosophical question and guide the reader uh, in answering it. Hmm. Yeah, so there's no simple answer to this or no one answer because I think works of fiction can raise philosophical qu questions in many ways. But I'll give sort of two models. Um, one is through the portrayal of problematic characters. So characters who there's something going wrong here. And you, as the reader, you can, you can follow the, 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 well, let's call it progress of that character with the problem in mind. Like, what is it? What is what going is wrong for this person? And what terms might be appropriate for sorting it out? So that's one model and I'll give one example, but the other is what I think of as more just conceptual that a, a work of fiction will put some concepts um, into motion, will put them into action in the descriptions and the conversations of characters, um, but it, it won't necessarily settle for the reader <laughs> the adequacy of those concepts to what's going on. So I think there's some ability for gaps to form in the, the reader's thinking like, yes, they're saying it's about X, but is it really about X? So again, I'll give you a quick example um, in a minute. Um, so uh, take Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Um, so I, I've written about that recently. <clears throat> and Emma is a very 
magnetic character like she is the center of that novel you're constantly like immersed in her and her doings and her her judgmentalness about her reality um but you know pretty much from the first page that <laughs> she's she's not the ideal person and and she's sort of unusual in this kind of kind of romance novel genre in being so problematic. She really does things that are not good um, and are deeply obtuse and mistaken. Okay, so I, reading her, um, actually I was triggered to think about her as, as a, an exemplar of defective action um, by another philosopher, Christine Korsgaard, talking about a different character in that novel, Harriet, Harriet, who's Emma's friend. And Korsgaard says something about Harriet's defectiveness as an agent. And I, I, I think there's a lot to say about that, but I thought that missed the point that Emma is the one whose defectiveness as an agent is like the, the, the hook for the reader, like what is wrong with her? So, so I think you get incredibly rich um, attention or the, the possibilities of like actually analyzing what's going wrong with her because like one thing people always say about agency is, well, you need to be autonomous. You need to be choosing things, doing them for yourself consciously, reflectively. And the thing is, Emma does that. Like she's autonomous in some, in some sense. I would say, and she still goes off the off the rails. So I found her really interesting in relation to a bigger philosophical debate that turns off into autonomy. And I just I just didn't think that would work to explain her problem. Um, I ended up talking about maturity, bringing in some other philosophers too. Like there's some sense in which she's immature. She's sort of acting in what you might call an autonomous way, but she's not mature in how she um, sets up her goals or tests herself um, as an agent, um, or in fact, how in being, she's immature in being open to criticism and change of mind and so on. So I, I think it's a great novel for pursuing this, like, what's, What's she doing wrong? Why is she not a model? Uh, um, even though in some ways she might meet certain philosophical paradigms of agency. Um, okay, so that's one example. Problem character, you get to, you know, just go through their experience and try to ask a, a philosophical question at every stage about them. Um, this, the idea that, questioning of our concepts. Um, I mean, that started for me way back with my, my PhD thesis project where I thought about fictions as conceptual thought experiments. And I still think of them that way often. So how does that work? Well, uh, I'll give you one of the first examples I wrote about, though not in my thesis. Um, very short story by Grace Paley called wants, W-A-N-T-S. Um, and it, it's, it's basically a woman taking a book back to the library that she's had out for, I don't know, 17 or 18 years. So I loved that. <laughs> but somehow that incident triggers reflection. Oh, when she runs into her ex-husband there. And this triggers a kind of conversation between them about their failed marriage, um, where he eventually says, I wanted a sailboat and you never wanted anything. And this is his explanation of what went wrong with their marriage. And I just loved this, this tiny story, this kind of compressed analysis of why a marriage could go wrong. And um, for me as the reader, like the first time I read it, it was like want, wanting a sailboat, wanting nothing. That's what he's saying, how they differed. And on the one hand, it was very persuasive to me or intuitively, 
that this could ruin a marriage if he wants a sailboat and I'm going to generalize about what that means. That's a kind of wanting that's very different. He's saying she wanted nothing. Um, and if you were trying to live with someone happily where your desires were, were sort, of sort of so unattuned, I'm not sure, you know, it would be hard for that marriage to last. Okay, so that was just one thing, how to understand the role of desire or wanting. But then, of course, this notion of wanting nothing, it also brings in this idea of wanting as lacking. I, she, maybe she could say, I lacked nothing. You know, that's why I didn't want a sailboat. I already had everything I needed. So, so conceptually, this issue of the word want being able to point us to desiring, you know, going toward things that hold goods in our view, but then it also can mean wanting as um, lacking. And that relation to what you might um, not need. Um, so, so that was kind of a puzzle for me, like, oh, this term wanting and it pointing me in these different directions. Um, but, but then I think that what the story further does is it raised for me this issue because the character, what she says is, oh no, I wanted lots of things. But she says all these strange things like I wanted to be a different person. And again, that's not like wanting to be a, wanting to get a sailboat. <laughs> so it was sort of, it raised for me the question, how can we use this notion of wanting things to be aiming for things so differently? And it, does this amount to a different concept that relates to different networks of issues in our lives? Um, does it, can you collapse them into the same notion of desire? Um, so, so maybe that's too fussy an example, but it, I, I want, I think they often are really fussy, like they're getting us inside the nitty gritty of how we are understanding ourselves with terms like wanting, desiring, wishing, hoping, valuing, and kind of pressing us to be honest about how we're using these terms, and then also honest about how they figure into our explanations of ourselves and how we differentiate ourselves. Again, this, this idea of how would I generalize about these two characters in this, this story? How would I assign the notion of wanting or desiring or lacking to them. And, and the story, the thing is the story gives you some fixed points that you have to deal with that their marriage broke down. The specific things she says about what she did in fact want, um, you have to grapple with them. And so it gives you, it gives you things to bounce off of um, that I think feeds your thinking well. Now, let me just make one kind of um, step back from that to raise an objection to this way of thinking. I think some people think works of fiction are totally cooked. They, they manipulate us. They, they set up how we are supposed to evaluate things. And so the idea that you could actually get a critical or reflective perspective on your concepts from a work of fiction, I think the argument is that's implausible. They're actually controlling our thinking. And I guess I, I don't, I mean, I just think that's not how I experience them at all. I experience them as some of the, raising some of the hardest unresolved questions possible. Um, and they're not telling me what to think. Oh, sometimes they do. I mean, of course, they can make a real argument. They can assess things very assertively, but that's just not the only thing they do. And sometimes what they are doing rather is saying, none of us quite understand this. We don't really know how we use the notion of desire. And um, and that's the the great thing they can do is set up certain questions like this. Um, I think maybe I'll wrap it up there. Yeah, so uh, thanks.
until we're uh, a number of very interesting uh, questions here today. I, I certainly enjoyed our conversation. Uh, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Bye.